Um, so this panel, as you know, is on Chinese investment in the U.S. I think it's a very pertinent topic for today, and we hope to have a really good discussion. Uh, we have distinguished speakers here. Our first speaker is Mr. Thilo Hanuman. Uh, Thilo is the research director at Rhodium Group, and one of his areas of expertise is the evolution of Chinese outward foreign direct investment and the economic and policy implications from this new trend. So we are going to start with Thilo. Um, he's going to give his presentation on the trend of the Chinese investment in the U.S., and then we'll follow that with Professor Sheena and Stephen. So. Is in, uh, in New York. And uh, one of the topics that I work on are global cross-border investment flows. And I would say in the last two years or so, one of the hottest topics in that area, of course, are increasing uh, capital outflows from China. And uh, so um, I was asked to kick off the panel by giving uh, you an idea of the, the dimensions and the patterns of Chinese investment in the US, and I'm going to focus on FDI in particular. And then I'll offer a couple of thoughts at the end on um, how these new flows might impact uh, the broader U.S.-China relationship, as this is the major topic of this conference. So looking at um, Chinese investment in the U.S., I thought it would be uh, useful to start off with a broader perspective. Um, as you know, the public debate is sometimes a little confusing about what investment is and, and uh, what the channels are. Um, so traditionally we distinguish between two types of investment flows. Portfolio investment, which is short-term investment flows in uh, easy to liquidate uh, assets such as corporate or government bonds or uh, stocks. And a direct investment, FDI, which uh, involves a longer term investment relationships and uh, uh, traditionally uh, an, an ownership state of 10% or more. So it involves a significant degree of ownership control. Um, what I uh, put on the wall here is um, <clears throat> the latest snapshot of what China's investment portfolio in the US looks like uh, from official data. I have to say that there's a lot of uncertainty about the, the accuracy of, uh, of of those, uh, of those data because it's increasingly complicated to compile uh, accurate um, um, statistics on, on cross-border investment flows. But I think three important points I wanted to make on this slide. Um, the first one, China is already a very significant investor in the US. Um, adding up all these positions, we get to about two trillion US dollars in Chinese assets that are uh, uh, held in the United States. Um, second important point, um, it is very much skewed towards or the ownership of U.S. Treasury bonds and bills and agency debt, which is basically the debt issued by government-sponsored enterprises like uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and so on. Corporate debt and equity portfolio investment, which means stocks, is comparably low, and at the right end of that uh, chart you see <coughs> Chinese direct investment assets in the United States, according to the uh, BEA, which is the, the Commerce Department's official data agency. Uh, and as you can say, uh, compared to other Chinese investment in the US, FDI is still very, very tiny. Uh, and it's also uh, tiny compared to total inward investment, inward FDI stock in the US, uh, according to our calculations, somewhere around um, half of a percent of total inward FDI stock in the US. So we're starting off a really, really low base. and. You know, in a popular debate, in a media debate, that's what people usually look at when they talk about Chinese investment coming to the United States. So why is it getting so much attention lately? I think there's two reasons. First of all, um, there's a really fast increase from almost nothing to, according to the latest official figures, about 10 billion, 9 to 10 billion uh, in 2011. Uh, and the second reason is because it's uh, uh, politically a lot uh, more controversial or difficult because it involves direct ownership and not just temporary ownership for investment returns. Now when we started to look at Chinese investment in the US, Chinese FDI in the US, we quickly, we quickly realized that there is really no good official statistics to track Chinese FDI projects in the US. 
uh, neither from the U.S. side nor from the Chinese side, um, uh, from the Ministry of Commerce. So what we decided to do is we decided to put up our own database on Chinese FDI transactions in the United States, uh, and that's what it looked like. Uh, so we collect data from a bottom-up perspective. So we go through regulatory filings, M&A databases, uh, company reports, media reports, and so on and so on. And we put all of these together, uh, both Greenfield projects, which are new uh, offices, factories, uh, um, whatever from scratch, and acquisitions that end in, a, in an ownership stake of more than 10%. Uh, and as you can see, <clears throat> there was almost nothing happening in the early 2000s. There was one uh, upward tick in 2005, which is mostly the IBM Lenovo transaction. And then since about 2008, we see a really, really strong increase in annual flows of Chinese FDI transactions, mostly on the acquisition side, but also increasingly in, uh, in greenfield transactions. So by the end of 2012, we count at about 23 billion in total uh, deal value, uh, which is a lot higher than the official, about 10 billion in official statistics. And the major reason is that a lot of these investments go through Hong Kong, Singapore, offshore entities, and so uh, the official statistics departments have really great difficulties tracking down the final ownership of those, of those deals. Um, <clears throat> so last year we reached a new record high of 6.5 billion, and um, in the first quarter of 2013 alone, deals completed or announced uh, already exceed 5 billion. So I think um, if things don't uh, deteriorate uh, in terms of the U.S. economic outlook, I think we'll probably hit a new record high of close to 10 billion this year in completed deals. Uh, the most important one is uh, the uh, acquisition of uh, ILFC, the aviation arm of AIG. If that goes through, that's 5 billion alone, almost. So why is this happening now? Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, misperceptions and debate out there about China's going global policy, that it's really a top-down approach, a, a government strategy uh, that the government tells its companies to go overseas and acquire strategic assets. Um, but I think it really uh, makes a lot of sense if you look at what's happening inside a Chinese economy and, uh, and then see uh, how that results in, in FDI. And um, that's uh, the distribution of Chinese FDI by industry in the U.S. And I think it gives you a, a very good idea of why Chinese enterprises have started to go abroad now. Policy, no question, is an important variable in all that, but uh, we think it's mostly a result of changes in the domestic economy. So before the mid-2000s, most Chinese uh, firms did not have a great interest in going abroad. Uh, so most of their FDI was very small-scale investment in trade facilitating offices, so wrap offices, uh, trade operation and so on. So that didn't really show up on the radar. Um, four or five trends um, since then that have happened. The first one, there's a really huge interest of Chinese companies to increase their share in overseas oil and gas extraction. And there, at the same time, there happens to be uh, a new oil and gas boom in the US, which gives those companies an opportunity to buy into um, medium scale um, um, oil and gas companies in the US. Uh, um, and so Sinopec, Sinoc, PetroChina, all of them have seized those opportunities. And oil and gas is the, the single most important um, sector that Chinese companies are investing in the U.S. in terms of FDI. Um, second trend is there's an increasing drive to upgrade technology in China. So we see a lot of investments in U.S. technology companies, industrial machinery, auto parts, uh, renewable energy. Uh, those are all sectors that Chinese companies are investing to get access to both actual technology, but also, most importantly, human talent and experienced staff that help them to run global operations. Um, the third important trend is increasing interest of Chinese companies in service sector assets. So um, it is expected that um, uh, the service sector is going to grow above trend in the coming years, and so a lot of Chinese companies are ramping up their, <coughs> their um, competitive assets in those areas. Software and IT is a big area, business services, financial services recently, um, aviation, leasing, and so on. Um, and then finally, um, <clears throat> the last trend I would like to mention, and it uh, will also play an important role for Professor uh, Shina's presentation, there's an increasing interest of state-owned entities, sovereign entities, 
investing in safe haven assets that give them a long-term stable return, like utilities that you see here, uh, real estate is coming up very quickly. Um, those are all safe haven assets, but have higher returns than treasury bonds. So those are the five trends that I would highlight um, explaining those, uh, those recent uh, increases in Chinese investment in the US, Chinese FDI in the US. Um, those broader motives um, have also really broadened uh, the geographic location, uh, the geographic presence of, of Chinese companies within the US. We count Chinese investment as of now in uh, at least 41 of the 50 US states with um, the coastal, the strong coastal economies uh, receiving the most investment, New York or California, for example, stand out. Uh, California's governor uh, uh, was just in China last week, uh, this week actually, to open a new trade investment office. So there's a lot going on between those economies. And then the second trend is that um, states that have industrial clusters that are interesting for Chinese companies, like auto and auto parts, are receiving a lot of investment from China, like, uh, like you see here in, in uh, Michigan or Ohio, um, um, or in Texas, the oil and gas industry. So that was a, a, a snapshot of, of Chinese FDI in the US, and let me offer a, a couple of thoughts on what all that means for uh, US-China relations uh, in, in coming years. So I think first and foremost, um, it's a really great opportunity uh, to uh, improve US-China relations. Um, Chinese investment in the US brings a lot of, can bring a lot of benefits to the US. Uh, one of the most important things is jobs, job creation. In the past, Americans, the benefits that Americans got from integration with China were mostly intangible. Consumer benefit, uh, 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 things like that are really hard to measure on the daily life of Americans. Now Chinese enterprises are coming here, are becoming taxpayers, are becoming uh, employers. We count that uh, Chinese enterprises, as of 2012, employed about 30,000 people. That's not a lot, That's a big, but it's a big increase uh, from the just 10,000 five years ago. Um, so we think that it can really give Americans greater equity in, in US-China integration uh, in the years forward. And then another area <clears throat> that um, we think uh, is important is spillover effects from that investment. Um, that can be innovation spillover. You know, people make the argument that there's really not yet a whole lot of innovation coming out of Chinese companies, but if you look back at the Japanese example, um, and then you see companies like Alibaba, for example, there is really uh, uh, the potential of uh, uh, local innovation spillover effects. And then another um, phenomenon that's maybe not so much out in the public debate yet is that um, uh, by increasing the stake of Chinese companies in U.S. operations, you attract a lot more people to the U.S. Uh, that's a very interesting curve. I think that's the green line is uh, tourist arrivals, Chinese tourist arrivals in the U.S. So, and it almost really uh, entirely tracks the line of uh, uh, FDI in the U.S. So by selling hotels, um, 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 service sector operations to Chinese companies, they bring in Chinese tourists. Uh, those tourists spend a lot of money in the U.S. And so there's a lot of spillover effects from that FDI uh, coming into um, into the U.S. as well. Those are just two examples out of, out of uh, many. So um, bottom line, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, at the same time, I think um, it's not all rosy. Um, there's also uh, a chance that this increasing investment becomes a new source of tension between China and the U.S. Um, the number one topic in public debate is national security concerns, uh, that this new direct ownership of U.S. assets in uh, by Chinese companies could lead to new threats to U.S. national security, and I'm, go I'm not going to comment uh, on that topic uh, in depth because uh, we have an expert here on CFIUS and those national security issues, uh, Stephen Heifetz from uh, Step Two, and I'm going to uh, leave it to him. Um, national security is one of them. An important point I want to make is that it's not the only one. Um, there are a couple of economic questions that are looming on the horizon, but they're becoming increasingly important as Chinese investment increases further. Just one example is um, uh, the perceived competitive advantages for state or enterprises in the U.S. There's a lot of people uh, believe that uh, subsidies given by the Chinese government, by 
Chinese state-owned banks to those enterprises, for example, in, in the form of cheap access to capital, um, would distort global asset prices, would be a disadvantage in competition with U.S. companies locally and on a global basis. And um, you know, if you look at the TPP negotiations, for example, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the U.S. is really pushing hard for those uh, 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 topics to be included in negotiations, and I think it's going to be um, a very important uh, point of tension in the future. Another related point is um, reciprocity in market access. China is arguably the most open developing country in a long time. At the same time, it's, it's still the least open, one of the least open economies, formally but also informally, when it comes to discrimination of foreign enterprises, and so on and so on. That was not a big issue in the past, but now that Chinese enterprises are wrapping up their investment in OECD economies, uh, more and more people are asking, why should we let the Chinese buy 100% of Volvo if we cannot buy 100% of a Chinese auto firm in China? Um, now, I'm not saying that's, that's, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a straight answer to that question, but uh, there's increasing political pressure in the US and in Europe uh, on China to change those asymmetries in market access. And then finally, my last point, and then uh, <clears throat> I'm going to hand it over, uh, I'll stay within my 10, 15 minutes, uh, is the institutional gap that still exists between China and the world's biggest um, uh, global investors. Uh, that chart plots uh, a data set compiled by the World Bank um, of the, 10, the world's 10 uh, um, biggest global outbound investors uh, ranging from Canada, Germany to China and Russia. And as you can see, there's a really big gap in, when it comes to uh, uh, areas like corporate governance, rule of law, uh, uh, control of corruption. And there's a lot of people that uh, think um, this could be a, a, a big impediment uh, for the future expansion of Chinese enterprises in the US um, and um, um, cross-border regu regulatory issues, uh, liabilities of Chinese businessmen and companies in the US and uh, the recent fraud cases of Chinese companies that are listed in the US are a first sign where that, those tensions have come up, but I think it's going to become a lot more important in the future when it comes to things like the, the legal system, independent courts, uh, litigation, uh, competition policy, um, and so on. So um, bottom line, um, there are really great opportunities uh, from this sea change in US-China FDI relations. Uh, for U.S.-China relations more broadly, but it's certainly not a one-way street to better U.S.-China relations. It requires a lot of uh, efforts on both sides when it comes to education and institutional reforms uh, to make this a success story and not a, a failure. Thanks.